This week on the Pro Wrestling Podcast, podcast. The game Triple H takes over as head of creative for the WWE. CM Punk gives his two cents on if he thinks things will change in the WWE now that Vince is gone. Tony Khan weighs in on if the changes in WWE will affect his business over in AEW. And Vince McMahon and The Rock are being sued as part of the XFL. I'm your host, Seth Grimes, and this is the Pro Wrestling Podcast Podcast. What up, y'all? Welcome to another episode of the Pro Wrestling Podcast. Podcast. I am your boy, Sev Grimes, here to talk another week of Pro Wrestling Podcasts. A lot of shit to get into this week. I'm excited to talk about it. I'm excited to be here with you guys talking wrestling, one of my favorite things to talk about. Very WWE heavy episode this week. Everybody's talking about the big news from last week. Vince McMahon retiring. Triple H taking over. Everybody's got their opinions. Everybody's got their two cents. And on this episode, not only are you going to get my opinions and my two cents, but I'm going to try to bring you clips from everybody else's this week on the podcast and shoot interview forums. And I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get to everything that I got on my list, but I'm going to do my best. Before we dive into everything, I want to shoot out some very quick plugs. If you could, please throw me a like, follow, and subscribe at Seth Grimes Media on Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter. You can also follow me, subscribe on YouTube. Just look for the Pro Wrestling Podcast podcast if you're listening to the audio. If you are watching on YouTube, just go ahead and throw a little subscribe ski down below. And uh, you can be up to date on any time I post new shit. I even got some bonus content up this week. Started doing some reaction videos. Got some nerdy reactions out there. Reacting to a lot of the trailers coming out for the MCU stuff. But enough about me. Enough about that. We can talk more about it at the end of the show. Let's just dive right into it because we got a lot to talk about here today. Starting with our first story here. Triple H taking over creative for the WWE. Triple H is taking over not only talent relations, but also full creative. I'm sure he'll have people, little minions underneath him doing his bidding. But Triple H is the guy, the visionary for creative in WWE. And of course, his wife Stephanie, co-CEO with Nick Khan. Uh, But I think the general consensus is that everything creatively, everything we're going to start to see on TV is going to be from the vision of the game, uh, Triple H. And I'm excited to see it. Triple H is a proven commodity in the world of wrestling, in creative. We've already seen what his vision can look like on the black and gold brand of NXT, of which was the greatest thing going in wrestling till AEW came around. And, of course, I am partial to AEW. I'm a big AEW mark. Uh, But certainly that put a big kink in the black and gold brand, at least in Vince McMahon's eyes as he changed it to the splatter paint brand of NXT 2.0. Uh, We are hearing rumors that that could change as well, that things might start to go back to Triple H's original vision for that product. Uh, But Triple H is the man now on the main roster. And though the main roster is not going to be able to do a lot of the same things that NXT was able to do, it's a bigger brand, it's more mainstream, it's got to reach a wider audience. And they can't just drastically change overnight or they're going to push away a lot of the people that are already uh, watching the boring ass stale product that's there right now. But who knows? Uh, Changes he makes may be able to bring people in as well. And this has shaken up the industry. Everybody's giving their two cents. I'm gonna cover a lot of that here today. Uh, Basically every clip I got is gonna be in regards to the Vince McMahon retirement or Triple H taking over 
or Stephanie McMahon as CEO. So I'm excited to get into all of that. Um, but as far as Triple H taking over creative, we do have a clip here from Nick Hausman over at Wrestling Inc. Was able to snag an interview with Triple H real quick and was able to ask him about what we might see going forward in the WWE now that the game uh, is in charge of creative. Uh, check out this clip. Uh, Triple H, I gotta ask, you're in charge of creative now. How is the product gonna be different underneath you as opposed to when Vince McMahon had the book? You gotta watch the show. Look, um, th this is the, the longest running stuff on TV. We say it all the time, right? Um, Raw, SmackDown, SummerSlam, just everything that we're doing, right? There are, there are a massive pair of shoes to fill that I'm trying in some way to step into, but I do not dream for one second that I can fill those shoes. By myself, it's gonna take, uh, period, but by myself, it's going to take a lot of us. It's going to take a team. It's gonna take everybody here to to fill those shoes and continue this on, but we will. We will. The, the, the intent is to continue the legacy of what has been going on, what made me fall in love with this business that he created, and to take it to new levels. Yeah, he didn't have a lot to say about it, um, but he just said kind of keep an eye on the product and watch it for yourself, basically, and I'm excited to. I will actually start watching WWE again. Uh, if you do listen to the podcast regularly, you will know that I am not a fan of WWE. I am not an avid watcher of WWE. I do follow it. I'm a wrestling fan through and through. I'm a born wrestling fan. I'm not a fair weather fan. I'm not a fly by night fan, but Vince McMahon's WWE product, his creative, basically drove me out of my fandom. I barely watched the product. I got to a point where I stopped watching the shows regularly and only watched the pay per views. And then I even got to a point where I stopped watching the pay per views. I only watched like a Mania or a Royal Rumble or something like that. He basically killed my fandom. Then AEW came in. Well, NXT before that. I always watched everything NXT. You know, NXT was a great brand, and that does speak to what Triple H can bring to the table. And then when AEW came in, I certainly, uh, that was able to draw me back in, and I started watching that product, and they haven't yet pushed me away, so that's a good sign. But now that Triple H is taking back over, and we didn't see much of it this past Monday, um, I did pop in and take a look at what they had going on Monday. Not a lot of changes in the product from what it uh, was before. I did hear, I don't know if this is confirmed or not, but I did hear that Vince McMahon had written a script before he officially retired. He had written or at least approved a script for Raw, and they mostly went off of that. Not only that, but going into a pay-per-view like SummerSlam, you don't want to make too many major changes, right? You want to kind of at least coast in and just kind of keep the status quo going into the pay-per-view. So I think a lot of what we're going to see from uh, Triple H as far as creative changes are really going to kick in on the Monday after SummerSlam. And that's a perfect place to kind of refresh and restart and kind of reboot the WWE program because uh, everything was already kind of lined up and booked for SummerSlam. I do expect to see some changes in SummerSlam. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of changes uh, are applied immediately. We'll probably not see so many fuck finishes. I'm sure we're going to see some good competitive matches. It'll probably be a wrestling heavy show. If he has any say in the actual uh, matches itself. Which I think he will obviously. But really this is going to kick into effect after SummerSlam. The Monday Night Raw after I expect to see some major changes. And then those changes are just going to continue and they're going to go throughout the whole product. We're going to see it on SmackDown. We're going to see it in NXT. We're going to start to see Triple H's thumbprint on the product. And I'm here for it. The man has proven himself. Like I said, NXT was a fantastic product. And Triple H rarely had a miss. All the takeovers were bangers. Uh, every takeover was like, how are you going to outdo the next? And they did. 
Um, and then there's a lot of other things to consider. You know, uh, one of the big things is that with Triple H taking over now, a lot of the talent that was leaving the WWE before were people that were frustrated with their position, frustrated with the booking, frustrated with Vince McMahon. And, you know, there's rumors that Triple H is already in talks with Sasha Banks, trying to bring her back into the fold, and Naomi. And he's trying to mend fences and trying to rebuild those bridges that Vince McMahon burned. And for all, all we're aware of, you know, there's a large contingency of people out there on the Internet that believe that Vince McMahon's secretly still pulling strings behind the scenes and that it's still going to be Vince's product, even though, you know, it's just retirement retired i'm retired wink wink um i thought that was the case that was actually my take on it until he actually retired and when he stepped down from ceo but it was rumored that he was still in charge of creative uh, my take on it was that this was only a wink and a nod that vince mcmahon was still gonna it was still gonna be status quo right but now that more shit's coming out about vince the dirt is piling up the bodies are being uncovered, and uh, we're starting to see more and more questionable stuff coming out about Vince McMahon. I really do think he's on the outs, and I wonder what Vince is going to do with his life now. Everything was wrestling. You know, what the fuck is he going to do now? But really, it doesn't matter, uh, because us as wrestling fans, life is going to move on, and we're in a fresh new era now where we've never been. Uh, basically, I, I venture to guess that there's nobody within the sound of my voice that is that has watched wrestling that was not in control by Vince McMahon. Uh, that everybody within the sound of my voice, their fandom has been within the range of Vince McMahon coming into power. If you were, if you are older people and you do remember a pre Vince McMahon WWF fucking a right man thanks for listening i appreciate you now you've lived through the whole vince mcmahon era um but this is uncharted territory and i'm actually excited stock price went up in wwe so i'm not even the only one other people are excited about this this is this change is being seen as a good thing everybody saw vince mcmahon is stale nobody liked vince mcmahon's product very few people and there are a lot of i mean if you go on twitter there is a very vocal, diehard WWE audience that will just, they're just, WWE, everything WWE does is great. And, uh, hey, more power to you if you enjoyed the product when Vince McMahon was in charge. But it was dog shit. It was flat out dog shit. And I do hope that we start to see some major changes and that Triple H's vision uh, is something that will not only make WWE more watchable, more entertaining, but will bring back wrestling fans and will create a whole nother boom period for the business. So that does remain to be seen, but I do have full faith in the man, in the game, in Mr. Paul Levesque. So let's uh, all sit back, kick our feet up, watch SummerSlam, see how it unfolds. And from the Raw after going forward, we are in the McMahon Helmsley era, baby. Woo! On to the next. One of the many people who had thoughts on the new regime change in the WWE was AEW CEO and President Tony Khan. Tony Khan was on the Busted Open podcast this week, Busted Open Radio on Sirius, as he is basically every week. And he had his thoughts on everybody talking about all the big changes in WWE now that the game, uh, Triple H is in charge. And uh, a lot of people are talking about, including myself, I brought this up as well too last week, that people that left the WWE because they were frustrated with the, with the creative, frustrated with the direction, frustrated with Vince McMahon in general. A lot of those people had a really good relationship with Triple H and NXT. A lot of those people came up through NXT and were used properly and were uh, had a lot of respect for the game Triple H. So naturally this is creating a lot of questions as to are a lot of these people, or at least some of these people that made the move over to AEW now maybe regretting their move over to AEW or possibly looking to jump ship 
back to the WWE now that Triple H is in charge. Um, check out this clip from Tony Khan giving his two cents on this topic. There's a lot of changes in pro wrestling. I think it's going to be really positive for the fans overall. I am a little amused that uh, changes in the competition, people think that it's just going to magically change the landscape. Like some of these accounts, like, you know, Twitter can be a very fun place to follow, but some of the narratives I've seen every day for the last week are really amusing me. Like, you know, I've got people signed here for five years and people think just because the guy, the, you know, the, the, the CEO, the chairman, the head of creative, those positions change in the competition. People I have five-year contracts with are just magically going to switch teams. Like, good luck with that. You know, Adam Cole is signed into about 2027 now. Uh, so I wouldn't expect to see him going anywhere anytime soon. Malachi Black's got like almost five years left on his deal. Uh, I wouldn't expect to see him going anywhere anytime soon. So just because these guys had some success uh, under a previous administration somewhere else, they're not magically going to be going anywhere up. Yeah, Tony Khan, never short of words, never short of opinions on things. He doesn't seem to think that this is going to affect his business at all. You know, he's quick to say that a lot of these guys that, that are being speculated to jump back over to the WWE are tied down to multi-year contracts. Specifically, he mentioned Adam Cole and Malachi Black having long-term contracts with AEW. Um, I do feel like just the way that he came off uh, when, when he reacted to this, he came off a little bit uh, defensive about it. And uh, rightfully so, because I do think that there is some merit to this. And I do think he has some reason to be a little bit salty about it. Because I think deep down in his heart of hearts, he does know that he was able to scoop up a lot of these great talents on the free agency market because of Vince McMahon. And he knows that a lot of these people came up under the game Triple H and have a lot of respect for Triple H. And that the reasons that everybody wanted to get out of the WWE doesn't seem to be a reason to get out of WWE anymore. At least time will tell, right? You know, we could get a year, two years into this and see that nothing's really changed. And it's still the same old BS over there. And we'll kind of address that a little bit later in another clip. Um, but as for talents jumping ship, uh, part of this also came not just from the common sense that Triple H is in charge now. And that he his thumbprints on a lot of these talents that went to AEW, but also uh, a report that Sean Ross Sapp had put out there from Fightful. Uh, he had mentioned that he talked to several people. I think he said a couple dozen that he talked to that left WWE about the situation. Um, but he is on record of saying that there was at least one person that said that uh, he does not regret signing with AEW. But if Triple H had been in charge at that time that he left, he would have never left. And, of course, there were so many people that, that left WWE that I, I really couldn't tell you which person this was. And, and Sean didn't say. Um, but, you know, that's I'm sure that sentiment goes to a lot of these people. I mean, a lot of them probably would not have become free agents if Triple H was the man in charge instead of Vince McMahon. Here is Sean Ross Sapp, though, just to set the record straight. He did weigh on it, he did weigh in on this just to kind of clear the air on this because a lot of people were quoting him as saying all these people, and that's really not the case. You know, that's not what he said. So here's Sean Ross Sapp setting the record straight on this. And all the people that were trying to imply that I reported that. People were ready to jump. That isn't true at all. Uh, at okay. least th based on those that I talked with. Yeah, so at least one person confirmed to him that they would have never been a free agent if it weren't for Vince McMahon in charge. And like I said, I do think that, that there's probably other people that feel that same way. But it is what it is. A lot of these people are over in AEW now in by all accounts, most people are very happy over in AEW. Uh, certainly over time, we're going to start to hear stories about people that are not happy with AEW. We have heard some, like the Jonathan Gresham news this week, for example. He certainly wasn't happy over uh, with his AEW contract or with Tony Khan. But you can't please everybody, right? 
Uh, especially in the wrestling business, everybody's fickle and bitchy and opinionated and high on themselves and marks for themselves and everything else. So this, this is the wrestling business, and, and it's going to go both ways. Just because Triple H is in charge now and Stephanie's in charge now and they're considerably more liked than Vince McMahon and they have uh, considerably better uh, creative and just better minds for the business at this point in time than Vince McMahon did. And no disrespect to Vince. You know, Vince, uh, what he was able to do with the WWE during his tenure over the last 40 years plus was nothing short of amazing, right? He created some of the biggest stars in wrestling history, um, paved the way for a lot of people, made the business a household name, made the business a multi-billion dollar business from, I think he only paid a million for the company from his pops. So uh, props to Vince for all he's done, but he was out of touch and his creative sucked and it was starting to drive people away in droves, not just talent, but fans as well. So with Triple H in charge, I do think things will be better, but that's not to say that it's going to stay that way forever. There's going to be people that don't like Triple H too. Triple H has an ego still. He's chilled out significantly from the days where he used to sit in on all the production meetings and bury everybody and put himself over and all that other stuff. All the things we used to hear about Triple H, all the things we used to hear him say on TV. And even even now there's a little bit of that. You know, it was just a couple years ago that he said uh, with with AEW that he's going to bury that piss ant company too or we're going to own that piss ant company in a couple years. And you know what? When it's all said and done, WWE, if <laughs> AEW ever does flop, certainly WWE is going to be there to uh, scoop up the pieces and add it to the Peacock Network, I'm sure, along with a Ring of Honor. But I do think Tony Khan's going to last a little bit longer in the wrestling business than people give him credit for. But time will tell again for that as well. But like I said, you know, people are going to go both ways always. There are going to be people that are frustrated with their spot in WWE. And even when that happens, like right now, WWE has a wide open roster. A lot of people were cut, a lot of people were fired, and now there is room to start to bring some people back into the fold. And, and AEW is very crowded, and AEW is going to be hard for a lot of these guys to be able to make their way to the top. And they might see an opening in WWE if they're able to jump ship. Much like Cody Rhodes, Cody picked the perfect time. There was Roman Reigns, and then there was... Pick your 90s and early 2000s wrestler that they bring back for, for you know, special events like Goldberg or Brock Lesnar. And, you know, then even below that was Seth Rollins, which isn't, you know, he can be a main eventer, but I wouldn't say he's a major draw for the company. The It was a perfect spot for Cody Rhodes to jump ship and just dive right into the main event picture. And then there's going to be room for other people to do that as well. But over time, once WWE gets crowded, once Triple H starts, you know, not seeing it in people or, or getting in beefs with people backstage or whatever over his own ego, uh, there's going to be people that are going to be going back and forth the whole time. And we've seen this time and time again in the wrestling business. And it's good. That's good. That's healthy for the wrestling business that there's places for everybody to work, somewhere for somebody to jump ship to if they're not happy or they think they're capable of more or they just want a fresh start so i think the business is in a very healthy place i don't think anybody's in danger of going out of business or losing all their talent or anything like that i think that's all hogwash i think it's just uh, we're on the precipice you like that word precipice precipice we're on the precipice of a hot product right now i think we're gonna see another boom period i said that last week and uh, barring any major pandemics happening again, pandemic 2.0, where everything gets shut down again and, and kind of kills the business again for a little while, I think we're going to see a very hot product on all sides across the board. So excited to see it and uh, excited to see what the future holds for both companies as the competition increases and things get hot. 
One person who's not so sure that things in WWE will change is CM Punk. CM Punk weighed in at Comic-Con. He was asked about what he thinks now that the regime has changed in the WWE. If he thinks that the culture will change in WWE and things will turn around. And he was not so optimistic. Check out this clip. Do you think because he tweeted that I'm retired, you think he's not going to be hands on and he's not going to, you know, but I mean, someday he is going to be for real. I, sure. I mean, we all are, but I, I, I don't think, I don't think the, I don't think the structure there, I don't think the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not, it's not at the cult. I don't think the culture there changes at all. You know, I, I think it is what it is. Uh, I'll, I'll put it to you like this. Um, they, oh boy, people are going to be real fucking mad about this, but fuck it. Um, Mercedes and Trinity leave and they announce on SmackDown that, gosh darn, we're so disappointed in them and they really let our fans down. Uh, Brock splits, comes back obviously, I think he worked the show, but where's Michael Cole saying, man, Brock Lesnar really let these fans down. I walked out, I walked out, they went on TV and they called me a quitter. What's changed? What's the difference? You're going to attack these two fucking poor women who've just kind of had enough and they walk? You got bigger balls than everybody there. Yeah, typical CM Punk, you know, always got uh, something negative to say about WWE. Look, I'm the biggest CM Punk mark in the world. By the way, I just spent way too much money on a CM Punk uh, ringside collectibles exclusive collectibles. I did, I collect a pulse. That's a word. Don't fucking argue with me, bitch. Uh, Ringside Collectibles exclusive of the first dance. First dance action figure of CM Punk. Comes with the uh, ice cream bar. I was at the first dance, as I've mentioned several times. Cheap plug if you want to go check out. I do have a full in-depth, in-person review of that event in my archives. If you would like to check that out. Uh, but I digress, right? So uh, CM Punk, never short on words, never short on uh, a willingness to talk a little shit about WWE. He's certainly bitter to the core about WWE. I love Punk. Spent a bunch of money on a figure for him. Um, but he, you know, he is a very salty man. And that rubs people a lot, of, uh, a lot of people the wrong way. There's a lot of talk online. People are like, oh, you know, CM Punk, blah, 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 overrated, blah, 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 blah. Always talking shit, blah, 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 blah. And he does, but hey, that shit's fun to me. I like the little bit of heated back and forth. I like those little jabs. That's competition. That's healthy competition, in my opinion. Um, but somebody that had their own contrarian thoughts about CM Punk and was not afraid to call him out by name and contradict him was the Road Dog. was also on the Busted Open podcast this week, and he gave his two cents on CM Punk's opinions of the whole regime change. Check out this clip. Only in WWE do you get to go, no, I don't like that, and walk away. <laughs> so, so, wow. so, you know what I mean? Like, the, think about that. And, and I'm including Brock in that as well. Like, I know he came back. I don't know what, what conversation uh, was held, but. You know, I also imagine everybody on social media jumping right to uh, uh, CM Punk as well. Let me go ahead and throw his name in there to, to start some social media buzz. Um, he jumped right to, oh, well, how come they didn't do to Brock Lesnar what they did to Sasha and Naomi? And I think it was a totally different, like it's apples and oranges. You can't compare the two. And so it's not fair to compare the two, but anything to make the WWE the devil. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's virtue signaling. Yeah, he's not wrong that the Sasha Banks and Naomi thing was slightly different from the Brock thing in that Brock came back and did the job, right? He he did what he was asked to do. He came back and was a professional after he freaked out and threw a tam temper tantrum. 
but that's Brock. Brock's a heated guy. He uh, gets tempered very quickly, and uh, he had you know time to cool off, and maybe he was talked to either by Triple H or even Vince himself, kind of talk him back into coming back. Uh, but CM Punk's overall sentiment is not wrong. There is still a double standard there. I do believe that. And I do think that it's not the greatest working environment for some of the women. Clearly, Sasha Banks left for a reason. Will that change now that Stephanie's in charge and Triple H is in charge? Perhaps. Um, but, you know, only time will tell for that. But Road Dog. Uh, was not shy about taking his shot back at CM Punk, and really wasn't shy about kind of burying AEW in this interview too, uh, while completely just sucking on that dick of Triple H. He was just all over, just slobbering on it. He he, he admitted that he was, uh, you know, he's like, as you can tell, I'm looking for a job right now. And then at the end of the interview, he had the nerve to say, you know, I'm, I am appalled by some of the things I see on AEW TV. And I've been begging Tony Khan for a job on every platform. And he won't respond to me. And I want to know why. Well... That's probably why is because you're appalled by everything you see on AEW's TV and you had the nerve to say that publicly, amongst other things, kind of taking his little jabs at AEW. And you know what? So be it. You know, everybody's entitled to their opinion and half of you listening feel exactly the same way. You know, and wrestling's very tribal nowadays. And I try not to get into that too much here. I try to, as a podcast journalist, it's my job to be fair and balanced and equal across the board. Um, though, you know, I, I haven't been shy about admitting that I, I don't really watch a lot of WWE anymore and that I am a fanboy of AEW for a lot of the things that they do. But I try not to put it in my product. And I try not to... Uh, alienate anybody that might be listening that has a different opinion because I think everybody's entitled to their opinion and you know I welcome that kind of conversation but wrestling is very tribalistic nowadays everybody wants to pick their sides and take their shots at the other side and if you go on any conversation on Twitter it doesn't matter what it is you know you see somebody post something about something and you look underneath it and there's going to be, you know, half the people are going to be uh, mocking you and laughing at you and ripping on you about your opinions. And the other half's going to be agreeing with you. And that's just the world that we live in nowadays. But especially the wrestling world. Fans are just so divisive. Everybody's a critic. Everybody's got their own opinions. And uh, everybody thinks that they would be Booker of the Year you know, and uh, know exactly what they're talking about and how they would do things or how things should be done. And Road Dog, no different. CM Punk, no different. Everybody's got their two cents in this whole thing, right? Time's going to tell if the culture will change within WWE. I personally think it will. I think, you know, especially for the women, we have Stephanie McMahon in charge. She has been an adamant fighter for the women's division she has been outspoken about it fighting for the women's division backstage so now that she's in charge and vince doesn't have final say i do think that we're going to see a lot change i think there's going to be more equality for women i think women are going to get more spots and i do think they're going to be taken better care of and more respected and appreciated backstage now, especially with Triple H in charge, too. I don't think that he's the type that's going to have those same kind of opinions as, as Vince McMahon, where, oh, she's not pretty enough to be on TV. You know, if she doesn't look like a girl that Vince would pay a million dollars to sign a non-disclosure agreement to suck his dick backstage for her spot on the roster, he doesn't want anything to do with her. I don't think Triple H is going to be that guy. Kevin Dunn's that guy, but we do believe that uh, it, you know his time in WWE is pretty short too. Even though Triple H did name drop him in his interview that we mentioned earlier with Nick Hausman, that uh, Kevin Dunn's on the team, but I don't think that that's going to be long lived. But time will tell for that as well. And uh, it's fun. It's a whole new era. Everything's up in the air, and we're gonna see. You know, we're all gonna watch and see how this plays out. And it's just, it's great for the business, however it plays out. 
We talked a lot about Triple H taking over creative, but what about Stephanie McMahon as co-CEO of the WWE? Freddie Prince Jr. is back with his new season of his podcast, and he weighed in on his thoughts about Stephanie McMahon taking over the position as co-CEO of the WWE, along with Nick Khan. Freddie Prince Jr. knows them both. He's familiar with both of them. And he had an interesting point of view, an interesting perspective and opinion on what he thinks things will be like with Stephanie McMahon and Nick Khan in charge. Check out this clip. And I'll give him this. He was the company's agent before he came there. Nick was not the first choice, and I'm not guessing on this. I know it for a fact because I'm friends with their first choice who passed. Okay, I know him. Our kids go to school together. They're on the same football team. So that's how I know. He works at Fox Sports. He wasn't their first choice. So there's a lot of ego there. And with Stephanie, if she senses any threat to the kingdom her father built, I'm not playing, dude. Shane's not the one. Stephanie is a stone killer. She's a werewolf, but not just twice a month. Like she could summon that power as soon as the sun goes down. And without you knowing, she will assassinate you, bro. Like she is a stone killer killer, someone who should be regarded and at times feared, but always respected. So if, if there's plans for that, and if he did do something to get her dad out, she's not going to play games or mess around. The fact that they're still there together leads me to believe that he didn't and that that is more conspiracy theory stuff, but she doesn't play, bro. She'll die for that company straight up. I like that Freddie Prince is back in action. He took a little break. His podcast goes in seasons, apparently. I don't like that he's got some other dude on there that I've never heard of anymore. Apparently, he's got a co-host now. I kind of liked the format of the earlier show where he was telling a lot of stories from his writing career. But now he says he's going to kind of switch to talking more about the current product. And uh, he had a lot to say about this whole regime shakeup. And, you know, he was... One of those people that said, too, that he never thought he'd see the day that Vince McMahon retired, that he thought Vince would literally die in the chair at the gorilla position. And I think we all thought that. And honestly, he probably would have if he wasn't under so much scrutiny and scandal from all of this uh, Wall Street Journal non-disclosure agreement, dick-sucking stuff going on. So, um, but... His opinion, listen, uh, he, he was pretty adamant that Stephanie is ruthless. And I think we've all seen that over the years. As much as we hear now that people are pretty happy that Stephanie's in charge and she's pretty well liked backstage, has a good relationship with everybody, maybe she's toned down a little bit. But I think us longtime wrestling fans know that Stephanie can be a cunt. And, uh, you know, if you're offended by the word cunt, you're a cunt. But uh, Stephanie is a cunt. She's a mean, mean bitch when she wants to be. Uh, by all accounts, she's very kind, very sweet, very caring, friendly, and, uh, you know, really fights for her talent and believes in them. And a lot of people have a lot of love and respect for Stephanie. But we know that if she wants to turn it on, I mean, she's one of the last people you want to get into it with because she will cut your balls off without thinking twice. Uh, Stephanie can be very ruthless, very vindictive, and uh, she's got that Vince McMahon-ness in her. She's got that ability to be the boss and be the boss with an iron fist and be a bitch if she needs to be a bitch. And, you know, she can be kind when she needs to be kind and be a ruthless, heartless bitch when she needs to be a ruthless, heartless bitch. Then, I mean, I think that's perfect for her role as CEO. She needs both of those. She needs to be able to stand up for herself and not be a pushover. She needs to be able to be the final say. She needs to be able to be a fucking boss with an iron fist but still have the kind heart and compassion that maybe Vince didn't have. And I think Stephanie has the perfect mix, perfect, uh, perfect mix for that. And as for Nick Khan, I mean, uh, you know, Freddie said that he knows Nick Khan as well, that Nick Khan from Nick Khan's days as an agent, he was an agent for a lot of talent before and just an agent in the entertainment business in general, a lifelong friend of the rock as well. 
by all accounts, Nick's a pretty cool guy. We all kind of blame Nick for being the one behind all the, the you know, the hundreds of cuts that WWE has had in the last couple of years and possibly preparing WWE for a sale, which is still definitely something that's on the table, though I think we're going to want to see how all this Vince McMahon stuff plays out before we talk about any kind of sale because nobody's going to want to buy the product if, you know, there's all this scandal around. All that's going to have to blow over and wash out and things are going to have to return to a steady normal before uh, I think we're going to really start to talk about people buying the WWE. Um, but Nick Khan, I think this is a perfect team. We always run the risk when there's co-CEOs of stepping on each other's toes or somebody's ego getting a little bit too big for their britches and some infighting going on or people not really knowing who's who to go to, you know, who's the final say. Too many cooks in the kitchen. But I think if Stephanie and and Nick can work together and have that relationship where you do this and I'll do that and we won't step on each other's toes, certainly we can sit and we can give each other's opinions about things, but as long as one person is mainly focused on one part of it and the other is focused on another, I think that's the sweet spot. Um, I think you know where that falls in is Nick's got to handle a lot of the business stuff, a lot of the the networks and the big money deals and all that kind of stuff. And I think you know if he is allowed to do that and allowed to kind of do that without being stepped on or or pushed you know pushed out of the way or being given contradictory thoughts and opinions by the McMahons. I think if he's going to be allowed to do that and Stephanie is allowed to just kind of head up the product, we're going to be in charge of, you know, the wrestling end of things and what's on TV and, you know, merchandise and creative and all that stuff. Her and Stephanie, the Stephanie McMahon, you know, the the McMahon-Helmsley era coming to fruition, if you will. I think they'll make a good team, but it will remain to be seen if they can coexist together. And if Nick Khan really is a shady motherfucker, if he really is trying to snake his way into a takeover of the business, we've heard a lot of those kind of rumors. And fuck, if he is, I mean, this was the guy, Triple H, just a couple months ago, I, I put a, a meme up on my Facebook and Twitter of, of you know, it was like uh, like the Mortal Kombat where you keep working your way up, you know, and Triple H was defeated, and then Stephanie McMahon was defeated. Both of them were out of the picture, essentially. And there's only one left, Vince McMahon. But now, uh, with Vince McMahon taken out, Triple H and Stephanie are right back up and in. And I think that's the sweet spot. I really do. I think they have the perfect balance. It's just, can they all coexist? It shall remain to be seen. But, you know, from a Freddie Prince Jr. and other people that know Stephanie and know Nick Khan, uh, they can be pretty ruthless and, and, and uh, they can get the job done. You know, they're nut cutters. And they're not going to take any shit. They're going to pick up where Vince left off. But if they can have that little bit of kindness and compassion and a better understanding of what the fans actually want to see instead of Vince's bizarro world, fucking his own imagination of what he thinks sports entertainment should be, I think WWE is going to be in a very good place going forward. Speaking of Vince McMahon, he is not out of the news yet. More dirt coming out for Vince McMahon. This time a lawsuit filed against Vince and The Rock. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Rock the Dwayne Johnson, brought into this lawsuit as well over the XFL. Apparently some fuck had put together some sort of market analysis that uh, found that there is room for another competitor in the market for uh, football. And uh, he's claiming that because he made up this fucking little analysis spreadsheet or whatever the fuck he did, that somehow it leaked out. And two years later, Vince McMahon got a hold of it. And then another two years later, sold it to The Rock. And all this insider information is the reason that they were able to start the company and push this guy out. I'm going to go ahead and read the official thing here. I have it on my phone. Just bear with me here as I uh, read this for you. This from PW Insider. 
A lawsuit against Vince McMahon, World Wrestling Entertainment, Danny Garcia, who is uh, the Rock's business partner and ex-wife of the XFL, ESPN, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Dick Ebersol, too, Jesus, WWE Chief Financial Officer Frank Riddick, Riddick's wife Carol, and many others were filed on July 20th before the United States District Court for the for the Northern District of Texas by David Adrian Smith related to the XFL Football League. Smith alleges in the lawsuit that on May 10th, 2016, he disclosed confidential trade secret information via email to Carol Riddick, including market analysis, opportunity analysis, strategic analysis, and dick pictures. Wait, nope, that one's not in there. And other business information regarding a concept for a minor league or developmental league spring football league. Smith advised Ms. Riddick that she is free to share with Mr. Riddick, but to keep it under your hats until we have a chance to discuss how to proceed or that it has no merit. Smith reveals that he had a back and forth series of emails with Carol Riddick with her asking several rounds of questions and Smith providing answers and further analysis of the opportunity, including further trade secret information. Smith stated that this correspondence stopped after he received no responses from Frank Riddick or Vince McMahon with feedback on what defendant number one, World Wrestling Entertainment, learned from their previous failed venture. Smith is alleging that the Riddicks disclosed the information and trade secrets. Smith also alleges... This is long-winded, excuse me. Smith also alleges the information was brought to Vince McMahon, who then shared it with former NBC executive Dick Ebersol and his son Charlie, as well as ESPN, and that the trade secret information, the elusive secret information, was used in the production of the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary. This was the XFL a year after Smith and Carol Riddick were exchanging emails based on the timeline. Smith is alleging that since WWE sold the rights and trademarks of the original XFL over to McMahon's Alpha Entertainment, it was due to members of the WWE board, McMahon and Riddick, being involved as they knew of Smith's trade secrets in the Ebersol, and that Ebersol launched the AAF as well in part due to his knowledge of the trade secrets Smith possessed. Smith is also alleging Alpha Entertainment, which is Vince McMahon's uh, other company besides the WWE, filed for bankruptcy and the XFL was purchased by Rock, the Dwayne Johnson, Danny Garcia, and the remainder of the current owners of the XFL. Uh, his trade secrets were disclosed, conveyed to and acquired, received to the new ownership without Smith's authorization. Smith is requesting, amongst other things, a declaration that the defendant's actions, as alleged, are unlawful and an injunction to prevent any actual uh, or threatened misappropriation of his trade secrets, an injunction to prevent the defendants from engaging in unlawful acts, and, well, it's already too late for Vince McMahon. He's engaged in lots of unlawful acts. And uh, order from the court conditioning that future usage of his trade secrets result in royalty payments and an award for damages brought by the unjust enrichment of the defendants for trade secrets, something about $15 million. court costs, pre-post, blah, 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 blah. Uh, look, man, I'll keep this short and sweet because that was long-winded as fuck, but I wanted to pass along all those details um, this is much to do about nothing. Uh, this is, the story is Lieutenant Dan. It has no legs. Well, you ain't got no legs, Lieutenant Dan. This will probably never even see a court date. This will get thrown right out. Um, even if, even if it does make it as far as the court, it'll never reach The Rock and Danny Garcia, the current administration of the XFL. Uh, it won't make it past McMahon, but I don't even think it'll go that far. Uh, this is pretty much, uh, hey, I came up with a bunch of ideas and thoughts and analysis and research on 
how there could be room in the market for a second brand in football. Whoop de fucking do. I'm sure anybody could do that as well. Uh, there's no real. Uh, there's nothing here. There's nothing to this. This is frivolous at best. Good luck proving anything. And even so, uh, you know, Vince McMahon started it, what, two, three years later after this, sh- this shit supposedly leaked out. And then it ended up folding anyway because of the pandy and it was sold and has yet to really see any kind of major return. So it's much to do about nothing. This guy's looking for a money grab. Probably looking to cash in on all the hype and dirt surrounding Vince McMahon currently. Wants to kind of pile on. Uh, It's a bunch of bullshit, in my humble opinion. But look, I'm just a simple small small town bird lawyer, as Jim Cornette would say, from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Fantastic show, by the way, Charlie. Gotta love Charlie. But it's much to do about nothing. But hey, I could be wrong. What the fuck do I know, right? Rocky Romero did an interview with Sean Ross Sapp over on the Fightful YouTube channel and podcast for Fightful Select. And he was asked his two cents about the whole regime change over in WWE and what his thoughts are about it. And if he is now open as being the sort of liaison for New Japan Pro Wrestling over here in the United States and all the Forbidden Door shit. That if he's open to working with WWE or if he foresees a future where they could be working with the WWE. And of course he said that he doesn't really see it as of now. They're happy with their relationship with AEW over here. Um, But you know even with like little things maybe here and there. Like when Shushin Thunder Liger wrestled in, in NXT. But he basically flat out said i wouldn't expect to see any new japan guys working in wwe anytime soon uh but then sean ross sap asked him if he has spoken with anybody at aew or (laughs) at wwe at all recently and he was a little bit apprehensive about speaking up about it before admitting that he has had a conversation with nick khan of all people and, of course, this perked up Sean Ross's sap's ears. And he had to kind of poke and pot, prod and try to dig into that a little bit deeper and see what other kind of information he can dig out of Rocky Romero. Check out this clip. Have yeah. you ever been a part of any conversations between, like, New Japan and WWE for any reason? Uh, not, not anything heavy. Lie. Like Lie. That. Give me a headline. <laughs> I spoke to Nick on once. Uh, did, you, did you really? <laughs> Had a very short conversation with him, but um, but it didn't go anywhere. And it's not really, it's not newsworthy. I feel like but I you can feel like the it's very and... newsworthy. I feel like it's absolutely newsworthy. <laughs> and you, you just it froze. Is. I might be you froze up on me a little bit again. But um, <laughs> I, I'm interested in what context was this conversation. Uh, it was like, it was very much just a feeling out. I think, I think WWE has always, I, I feel like has always been interested in new Japan content yeah. somewhere like with, whether it was like network before or Peacock now or whatever it is. But I feel like that, that that's always been a conversation because they're, they're, you know, they, they collect content from everybody. Right. So I feel like maybe that's one thing that they would always kind of wanted was to have maybe some kind of Japanese wrestling sure. and, you know, why not have like the best one on, on one of those. So I feel like, uh, I think that was what pretty much the conversation was. Yeah. WWE is just a bunch of content whores. That's all they care about. They're not really interested either in forbidden door stuff. They don't really care about working with other companies. Certainly with triple H in charge, he's smarter to the business. He has more of a, uh, an ear to what fans want And he's more aware of all the wrestling around the world. Whereas Vince McMahon didn't even know what the fuck the fucking didn't even know what year it was. I'm sure, you know, Vince McMahon was laser focused on WWE only. And he only was aware of people outside of the E if a videotape was put in front of him. Triple H, that's not the case. And we already saw with Shushin Thunder Liger coming in to work for NXT 
that Triple H is not opposed to bringing people in, at least for the NXT brand. I don't know about the main roster, but, you know, Royal Rumbles and shit like that. We have seen that in the past, right? We had uh, we had Tenru and Katowl, as, uh, as uh, Bobby Heenan would say, Katowl, Katowl. Um, you know, we've seen this kind of stuff before, at least for Royal Rumbles and that kind of thing. Uh, Triple A, was it Triple A that was working with WWE back in the day when they did that Rumble in Texas? They had a few uh, wrestlers from Mexico in there. So it's not like something that's never been done, but it is very rare. More likely with Triple H, but I don't expect to see much of it anytime soon. What they care about is content. That whole conversation with Nick Khan... I guarantee you, you know, it was, it was basically said by Rocky Romero, but it's about, hey, can we bring over some content to put on our network? You know, they're looking at, this was probably around the time where they were trying to buy up all the indie, or at least get other indie promotions to put their content. You know, there's ICW from over, over in England, and uh, what else did they have? I think they have Evolve. Is it Evolve? They have some other shit on the network that they were able to kind of make deals with. But, uh, you know, if WWE had their way, they'd be able to scoop up all the content. I'm shocked that they didn't make a play or at least a bigger play for Ring of Honor to get that content library because they have so many people on their roster from Ring of Honor. Um, but, you know, if the day ever comes where they're able to make a purchase of AEW and Ring of Honor together, they're going to love that shit. But I think that day is a lot further away than we would give it credit for being. So, uh, much to do about nothing in that conversation, but it is interesting that uh, Rocky has had a conversation with Nick Khan, that it is Nick Khan out there trying to make those deals for the network and talk to these other promotions and bring in that other content. Um, and it's probably Nick Khan that was uh, working with AEW when uh, a few of their guys were uh, on the WWE Network or on the Peacock Network to do the documentary thing, you know, to to talk about whatever the fuck that was. I don't even remember who they were talking about, but they had Brian Danielson and Chris Jericho, amongst others, that were over there on uh, their network doing some talking head shit on the documentaries. So we might see more of that. Tony Khan's been pretty open about that. We saw Chris Jericho on the Stone Cold thing, too, Broken Skull Sessions. I think we'll see more of that in the future. Uh, possible Hall of Fame stuff, you know, they like to get people for the Hall of Fame for whatever reason, you know, they, they made that play with TNA before, uh, you know, they traded Christian away for Ric Flair at one point, so I think, you know, that door's open and Tony Khan's always been willing to work with them, and, uh, you know, I think New Japan, if WWE did want to bring in a guy for a Rumble or for an NXT spot or something like that, I think they'd be open to it. But I don't expect to see a lot of that kind of stuff in the future. But it is interesting to hear that uh, Nick Khan is out there having those conversations with some of these other major uh, wrestling companies. Another fire interview. This one from Natty Neidhart. Um, usually don't see too many interviews from her. And when you do, they're not really newsworthy. Though she has been in the news a lot lately, you know, for the Liv Morgan thing. And now this here. She was on Busted Open talking about uh, kind of uh, venting her frustrations with her spot in the WWE. And feels that she's capable of a lot more and just waiting for her opportunity to show it. Check out this clip. Both times that I've been at NXT, I've just felt so loved and so appreciated. And so, like, all of my hard work through the years, like, it mattered. And it's not to say that I haven't felt loved and appreciated on the main roster because I've had incredible moments on the main roster and I'm so grateful for all of them, but I'll be the first to admit it just, it's just been like through the years, I just feel like I, <laughs> it's been a, it's been a damn struggle. Um, and I feel like even now with all these changes happening within WWE, I'm like, I'm always so hopeful that one day, one day I'll walk into work and just everything is going to change in the sense that like, this will be my day. This will be my chance. This will be the moment where like somebody sees something in me other than just being like a good hand, because I think it's great to be reliable. It's great to be dependable, but like, I know what I'm capable of. And every time I'm at NXT, I'm able to like 
break through and show people like, hey, I can speak, I can perform, I can, you know, I have beautiful costumes, I'm reliable, you know, I, I'm everything that you need. Just let me get a little momentum. Just let me get right. a little momentum. Yeah, I get her frustration. I really do. I can see why she feels the way that she does. I just think it's a a bit of a misguided perception of herself at this point. I don't know that she's as self-aware as maybe she needs to be. Look, uh, you know, does she deserve a token run as champion or get a good main event run? Sure, of course she does. She's been there long enough. You know, if you're going to hand out token title shots or token main events, certainly Natty Neidhart's somebody that deserves it. But, you know, because she's a workhorse for that company for 15 years. She basically built the women's division. She was the person behind the scenes training everybody, working with everybody, getting everybody up to speed. All these new people coming in, all these people that they're trying to build, they go through Natalia Neidhart, right? But I think she needs to be a little bit more realistic about her spot. She's not a main eventer. And though she feels like she's a total package, she can talk, she can whatever. And look, she had a run in NXT as champion, as women's champion. And that might have been her token world title run, you know. I don't see why, I don't know what else she wants. Does she expect herself to be the main event of WrestleMania night one against like fucking Bianca Belair or something? Becky Lynch? I, I just don't see it happening. You know, maybe um, at some point she could become like a monster heel and she could get like her, uh, her, you know, her like Mark Henry, you know, late in his career had that one, the Hall of Pain run where, where he was able to kind of do a, a dastardly heel turn, get some major heat that was a, a fairly significant and memorable angle to cap off his career. Maybe they could work something in for Natty where she can be a vicious heel and really just kind of turn on and invent those frustrations publicly and, and kind of take it out on some of the Barbie doll wrestlers and stuff like that. But to me, Natty is, I mean, I would love Natty on my roster, you know, but I think where she's slotted is perfect. And I don't think she should take that as a bad thing. Look at, there's very few wrestlers, male or female, that have been able to last on the roster for 15 years. Especially with Natty, she's not the Barbie doll that Kevin Dunn and Vince McMahon like. You know, they've done the fart jokes with her and everything else. But she is that go-to player on the roster that's there. You need that key person when you want to bring up a Ronda Rousey. When you want to bring up a Liv Morgan. You put them through Natty. Because Natty is a fucking excellent worker. She's one of the best female wrestlers on the roster in the world, to be frank with you. She's fully capable. And, you know, she is the total package in a lot of ways, you know. And, and even in the looks department, not just physically, but even like she mentioned, she's got great ring gear and stuff. She's been able to keep herself fresh and, and really be able to hold up her end of the deal. But really her role is that gatekeeper role. And that's an important role in, in wrestling. Not everybody can be the main event star. Not everybody can be Johnny Depp and Pirates of the Caribbean or fucking Brad Pitt, you know, or, or name your top guy in Hollywood, Chris Hemsworth or whatever. Not everybody can be that. Sometimes your role is to just be Mantis on the Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, like there's, or there's, there's very key players in professional wrestling that don't always get their flowers, don't always get the main event run, but wrestling needs these people too. Wrestling needs people to build other people up. And the fact that Natty is trusted to hold that spot, the fact that she's been on the roster for as long as she has, has that tenure, has that respect. She's the mother of the women's locker room. Everybody goes to her for advice. Everybody respects her. Everybody learns, uh, sits under her learning tree. Um, you know, I think she's got a great gig, and it kind of sucks that she feels like she's getting the short end of the stick, and that the only reason that she's been there so long is she's holding out hope that one day she walks in and everybody goes, My God, Natalia, 
we, what have we been doing with you? We need to get you in the main event spot. Uh, I just think it's misguided, and it's not a knock on Natty. I don't say that to say that she's not deserving or that she's overrated or anything like that, underrated. I think Natty is a fucking key player, a must-have. Uh, she should get paid very handsomely. I would give her more money, even. Sign her to a huge contract, even after she's done wrestling. I want her backstage as a women's agent. Uh, along with TJ, right? Her and TJ are, can be, you know, agents together. I think that's a great spot for her. I, I, she has a lifelong spot on the roster. She's a hell of a talent. She's a hell of a hand. She doesn't like to be a hell of a hand. She wants to be Ronda Rousey. She wants to be Becky Lynch. She wants to be Charlotte Flair. It's just, it's just not, not everybody can be that. And I think she should be very happy that, you know, she needs to change her perspective a little bit. And I know that's, you know, it's easy for me to say. And, you know, what the fuck do I know and all that shit. She needs to know her role. I, I, I know it might sound like that, but I really don't mean it like that. I think she should be very proud of her spot, that she is the building block for the women's division, that she is the measuring tape for the women's division. She should take a lot of pride in the fact that she's the one that is there to, she's the secret sauce in the women's division that's going to pull all these people up and get them trained up. She trained the fucking Bella Twins. She trained everybody. Since she came in, she has been that key player. So uh, it kind of hurts my heart a little bit that she feels so sad about her career and that she aspires to more. And everybody should aspire to more, but the fact that she... Kind of, you know, that's her motivating factor is that someday somebody will wake up and see her as the next Charlotte Flair. That kind of just, it hurts my heart a little bit because she's so good at what she does. You know, she's, she deserves all the flowers in the world, but in, in maybe her token run, I don't know. She had it in NXT. I think that's what it was. I just, I just think not everybody can be the main event. Not, you know, that's just what it is. So. Uh, she's in a sweet spot, and you know I hope that she continues to have a long, long career in wrestling and continues to be the driving force behind the women's division for years to come. And I hope that her happiness isn't you know, set on being the WrestleMania main event. That's it. That's all I got for you guys here today. Uh, I do have plenty more I could go on and on and on, but I don't want to, tr I, I try not to keep you any longer than an hour if I can help it. It'll always be give or take an hour, but I'm not going to try to push into that hour and a half range. I think that's just a bit much. So I'm going to leave some on the table, but I've given you all the meat and potatoes, given you the best of what we got for this week from the pro wrestling podcast world. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I very much appreciate you guys. Please, this is a little bit of a call to action for people that do uh, follow the show regularly. Please, if you're listening on the podcast forum, please hop on over to YouTube. Check me out in video format. Throw me a subscribe. Follow me on social media. Um, I'm trying to do, I got a lot of clips that I'm putting out now. I'm trying to do the shorts and the TikToks and that kind of thing. I'm also just posting a lot of random con content, you know. Uh, we suffered a very big loss this week in the world, of course. R.I.P. to the Chaco Taco. Um, so I had a few fun posts about that as well. What the fuck are they doing getting rid of the Chaco Taco? Are they crazy? Are they crazy? That's a sadness. That's sadness. We should sign a petition to bring that shit back. Um, but please... Like, follow, and subscribe on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at Seth Grimes Media. Um, I won't let you down. I'm going to continue to try to put out as much content as humanly possible between working my shoot job and having kids and the, you know exercising for the little bit I do and eating for the lot of bit that I do, all that stuff. Um, on YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, please throw me a subscribe. If you haven't, share a video, share me, spread me around. I do have a book out as well. If you want to support, you can support by buying my book. It's The Gathering, A Bold Journey into the Belly of the Juggalo Underworld. You can check that out on Amazon in paperback, on Kindle, 
as an e-reader or if you're an audio person it is on audible as well i do prefer the audio version because the narrator is so fucking dope i love that shit it's a great book uh it's a novel about a music festival drug-induced debauchery great shit i also have nfts pro wrestling inspired nfts in fact a lot of people will scoff at nfts and uh you know that is that is your opinion uh my opinion is i have dope nfts that are inspired by your favorite championship belts mashed up with all the top cryptocurrencies like the wwe championship very fun uh go check that out links in the description below and finally finally i just want to thank you guys thanks for hanging out thanks for supporting the show I will continue to try to grow and bring you the best content that I humanly can. I'm going to do a little something different this week. Uh, Normally this is where I will sign off and I am going to sign off here. Um, But I do have one more clip that I wanted to share with you. And I don't really have a lot to say about it. So um, I'm not going to follow it up with any kind of opinions or anything like that. I just thought it was a fun clip that I wanted to share with you. So if you stuck around to the end, enjoy this little bit of bonus content from Foley is Pod. And uh, this is Mick Foley's rendition of the WAP, the WAP, the wet-ass pussy song from, what is that, Nicki Minaj that sings that? Mick Foley has a version of it, and I thought I found it very humorous. Um, So I will leave you with that. Peace, love, and pizza. I am your boy, Seth Grimes, and this has been the Pro Wrestling Podcast Podcast. What's this? What is What is that? It's trying to look hard. Which is why I'm not doing my version of WAP. Uh, oh, no WAP. Today. No, I've, I wrote some of the lyrics down, and it's uh, come along well. Um... <laughs> Do you just travel with cue cards? <laughs> birthday boy in the house, birthday boy in the house. Yeah, yeah, so I think it's going to be pretty good. Uh, I, I, I need to get in the zone just one of these days, just, just break it out. But I was working on it last night. Yeah, dude, singing about a happy-ass birthday. I was thinking hard about your happy-ass birthday. Gonna get a card for your happy-ass birthday. So we're working on it. But I don't think... That's appropriate for a 14-year-old.